So I now I'm very excited to turn to our speaker, Denny Wang, who is an evolutionary researcher and mycologist who graduated um, in botany at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is currently a postdoc associate at the biostatistics department at the Yale School of Public Health. That's an interesting and cool place. I would like to hear about how you ended up there with um, the mycology background. That's super fascinating to me. Sorry. I always get on these tangents. Um, so Denny's research focuses on fungal genetics and their ecological roles. And he mainly studies the genus. Um, I don't know if you say Amanita or Amanita, but tomato, tomato, that guy. Um, and including their endomycorrhizal ectomycorrhizal ectomycorrhizal association with trees and their mating system. Um, that was what he mostly studied during his PhD. He's now switched his focus to ascomycetes, especially mycoparasites such as uh, trichoderma and talibocladium. So I hope I didn't butcher that. Denny, thank you so much for being here. And we're super excited for your presentation. Um, I've got to say the title of it because it's too good. Weird Sex in Death Caps, the Unisexual Reproduction in Invasive Californian Amanita or Amanita Phylloides. So thank you, Denny, and take it away. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Annie, for the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to my talk. Um, I'm excited to share with you about my findings in the invasive death caps during my PhD. And so my journey started from my interest in mushroom and the genus Amanita. Yeah, I pre pre pronounced Amanita. Um, I think most people here already know this genus. For example, there's the uh, Fire Agaric, uh, Amanita muscaria. They produce hallucinogenic compounds um, and uh, it has been portrayed in Super Mario. On the other hand, there's Caesar's mushroom Amanita caesarea. It is edible and is known to be loved by ancient Rome emperors. And uh, this is something I found on the internet, which looks interesting. I have a mushroom here. Um, and there are other inter interesting amenita species. For example, this New Zealand amenita. Uh, it has a naughty cap um, feature. And we don't have a name for it yet. So if anybody want to name a species, there's your chance. And uh, there are also these truffle-like amenita. Uh, they are mostly from South America and Australia. Um, this may be a unique adaptation to Mediterranean climate. And uh, it's also quite interesting to me. Um, but the most infamous species of this genus is probably death cap. Um, people have claimed it to be the deadliest mushroom in the world, and it only takes a single mushroom to kill a person. Um, it is also responsible for the deaths of many famous historical figures. For example, this one is uh, Roman Emperor Claudius. And uh, these fungi are originally from Europe, but they were introduced worldwide uh, since the last century. And they are especially happy in the West Coast, um, although uh, you can also find them uh, in the no Northeast, uh, specifically in um, New York and New Jersey. Uh, my lab, uh, my PhD lab is very curious about why these death cap is so, uh, are so successful. And so we decided to study the invasion biology of them. Um, we, we don't know too much about um, the biology of the death cap, and so we use the knowledge from other invasive species as a, a proxy for what we study. And for example, uh, these beautiful flowers, uh, they are all invasive plants, and they are all able to self-fertilize. And so there's a, a famous um, biologist uh, called Baker, he postulated that being able to self-fertilize is especially advantageous when they are introduced into a new range. Um, so you can imagine when uh, these plants come to a different uh, environment, there will not be a lot of their, uh, there's other organisms or other plants that are uh, capable of mating with them um, in that environment. And so if they are able to self-fertilize and produce offspring by themselves, um, it will be very beneficial for them. 
And so we are aiming to understand the reproductive system in amino haploidies. Maybe they are like least plants. Um, so before we talk about how death cap reproduce, it would be nice to know the typical way of uh, mushroom to reproduce. Normally, uh, the spores from the mushrooms uh, would germinate into haploid mycelia. And it means that in each mycelium, um, there's only one copy of genome. Um, unlike ours, uh, we have two copies of genomes. And then uh, afterwards, these uh, two mycelia, um, if they are compatible, they can mate and fuse the cells, but not fuse the uh, nucleus. And so in each cell, there will be two copies of different genomes, and also uh, they are enclosed in different nuclei. And we call it heterokaryotic. And uh, these heterokaryotic um, mycelia would uh, form these mushrooms, and each heterokaryotic mu uh, mycelia can produce multiple mushrooms. So uh, multiple mushrooms are like the apples of a single individual. And within these mushrooms, there are basidia, uh, where the two nuclei fuse and split again into sort into these spores and the spores would drop and continue the life cycle. And what I described is a heterothetic mating system. And these uh, mushrooms are uh, heterokaryotic. They have two different nuclei. Um, and there will also be heterozygosity, which means that there are two different genomes in fungi. In some species, however, the haploid uh, mycelia, the single genome mycelia, uh, do not need to mate with another mycelium, it itself will just form a mushrooms. And we call it a homothetic mating system. And their mushrooms are homokaryotic. There are only one type of nucleus in the mushroom. Yeah. And so they uh, often lack um, heterozygosity. So there are no two copies of genomes in the mushroom. Um, but note that uh, in mushrooms, normally one species is either associated with a heterothalic mating system or a homothetic mating system. So this one. Okay, so that's the background of uh, fungal reproduction or mushroom reproduction. Now uh, let's switch back to death caps. To understand the reproductive systems of death caps, we sequenced the genomes of 86 genomes. Um, some of them are from uh, Europe, but most of them are in California. Um, we found that they belong to 37 different individuals or mycelial networks. And so I try to figure out um, the heterozygosity of uh, each mushroom or in each individual. Um, just a reminder, heterozygosity is um, no, uh, if there are two different um, genomes in the mycelia. And um, we've, I found that like, there are two individuals, um, actually eight mushrooms have very, very low uh, heterozygosity. And uh, along with other analysis, I found that these individuals are homokaryotic. So they don't have two different nuclei in the cells. They don't have two different uh, copy of genome in the cells. Everything is just a single one. And so um, amino phylloides or the um, death caps, they generally develop mushrooms with a mate being heterothalic, but it can also develop uh, mushrooms without a mate being homothetic. And interestingly, if we look at when we fa have found these two homokaryons, we found that um, they can live for a very long time. 
Homo carrion uh, genotype one, uh, uh, G21, it has survived uh, for at least seven years. And um, genotype 22 or G22, um, it has survived for at least 17 years. Um, and worth noting is that this is the course of our study. And this is very surprising to us because we often associate homocaryons are uh, being transient or short-lived. And so uh, this is um, pretty um, uh, interesting for us. And one immediate question uh, we have about these homocaryons is if these homo two homocaryons are also mating with other uh, heterokaryotic um, death caps, so they obviously don't need to mate to form mushrooms, but could they also mate? Perhaps these uh, homocaryons are actually a different species of death cap we have never seen before. Um, so uh, we did, did a kinship analysis for this question. I'll um, skip the details, um, but generally speaking, we, uh, we, ca we can use the genome uh, data to identify which one could be the offspring or the parent of these um, death caps. And so if you look at these uh, mushroom physical maps, each dot is a mushroom. And the same color, except for the gray ones, indicate the mushroom belong to the same individual. For example, these belong to the same individual. Um, the square ones are homocaryons. These are homocaryons. G22 and these are G21. And the ones with rings, for example, this one, the uh, sky blue dot have a pink ring. That means that it is the, either the parent or the offspring of these, uh, these homocaryons. And so we have evidence of these um, uh, homocaryons are actually uh, mating with other um, heterokaryotic mushrooms. So that's quite interesting. It fits the hypothesis that we talked before, talked about before, that is uh, some of the death caps may have come to the US and started to reproduce by itself. And then other, um, other death caps came along and find this um, a lot of mating partners in the US to mate with. Okay. And the next question we want to address is if these homocaryons make normal mushrooms, um, because oftentimes when we induce homocaryotic mushrooms in the lab, uh, a lot of them are aberrant, um, only having stipes or stuck in the primordial stage. And this is this question is uh, specifically interesting for me because I didn't collect the mushroom um, uh, originally by myself. Um, other people have collected, and so I need to uh, go to California by myself to uh, check out these mushrooms to for confirmation. And we found that uh, heterokaryotic mushrooms look like this. Uh, with a quite typical amenita morphology. It has a stipe, a cap with a ring on the stipe and a cup uh, at the bottom of the stipe. And surprisingly, homocaryons also look normal. So when we are collecting, we have no idea which one is, could be homocaryotic, which one uh, is not uh, homocaryotic. And uh, we only figure out uh, after sequencing their genomes. And so uh, we were not able to find any uh, differences when collecting them. So they are uh, macroscopically indistinguishable, uh, at least for us. So um, they are macroscopically indistinguishable. What about um, microscopically, if they are uh, distinguishable or not? And particularly, um, 
we are also interested in if they are producing spores and basidia. So if these homocarinus are fertile or sterile. So again, uh, let's look at the heterocarions again. And so we found these heterocarions can produce these uh, typical basidia uh, for spores growing out from a basidial cell. However, they also produce like crazy basidia. Uh, for example, this one have three spores, this one have two spores, this one have only one spore. And so this is quite uh, interesting. And uh, we uh, look at the homocarins as well. And we found there are no difference, uh, no obvious difference between the heterocarions and homocarions. Uh, they both can produce like four, three, two, one spored basidia. Um, there, the only difference is probably in the ratio of different types of basidia but uh, we don't have enough um, observation on this basidia to give it a clear call. Okay, so the homocarions, karyotic mushrooms uh, macroscop macroscopically look normal. Microscopically, it doesn't look that normal, but it's pretty similar to the heterocarions. So uh, we, we sort of like uh, ends our um, observation part of the um, these homocarion homocaryotic mushrooms and start to uh, figure out try to understand how, uh, what have driven the formation of this these mushrooms exact uh, especially uh, what's the genetic control of uh, the formation of these mushrooms. And since mating are generally uh, thought to be required for mushroom development, I decided to first learn about the genetic control for mating in aminophiloides. Um, in a normal mushroom forming fungus, mating types or uh, these mating genes are usually controlled by two uh, loci. Um, one is called the homeodomain lo locus. Um, the other is called pheromone receptor pheromone uh, locus. And you can think about the loci or locus are just um, places in the genomes. And so they, con they are consist of um, a few different genes, for example. Okay. And... Uh, when these uh, mating type loci or mating type genes are functional, they are uh, they usually have a lot of diversity in them. The genetic diversity is high, and um, and so we try to um, look at the sequences of these loci or these genes and see if we can also see a high diversity of them. Um, so I use the traditional uh, population genomic method to explore the HD locus first, the homeodomain locus first. And this is called a mapping uh, mapping strategy. And just just give you a context. Um, usually we have an assembled genome, so all the DNA information are um, are, Sorry, all the DNA information are in the string of um, ATCG, the nucleotides. And then uh, when we sequence the uh, um, mushrooms, the, the, the DNA in these mushrooms we are broken down into short uh, sequences. And so we can map the short sequences back to the reference genome, the assembled genomes. And, uh, and so we can see, okay, for example, here, um, there's a mismatch here, meaning that uh, the mushroom have a slight different um, sequence from the reference genome. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, we have a hard time mapping 
the uh, HD locus, the homeo domain locus. This means this probably means that there is there are too much diversity here, and so uh, the sequences look way too different to um, let the um, let the program to uh, map them together. And so I just changed my approach. Um, so remember that I talk about the genome, the reference genome. Um, how we get that information is we assemble a genome. And uh, this is basically like a puzzle game that you have when you sequence the mushrooms, um, you have these short reads and the short reads, you can just see, okay, this read and this read uh, look very similar here. And so they probably have an overlap here. And so um, you can just put the, all these things together to get a single genome assembly. Um, this uh, approach uh, is great for our purpose um, because uh, when there is a high mismatch between the two copies of genomes, um, they will form this kind of bubble. And so this part have one copy of genome on the HD locus. Um, this part have the other copy of the HD locus. And uh, so we can pull the uh, gene sequences out um, from this bubble for each of the genome. And we indeed see a high nucleotide diversity. And that means that, okay, we confirm that this homeo domain genes in Amenta phalloides probably are doing something related to uh, sexual reproduction. Um, however, when we look into the thermal receptor and thermal locus, um, we didn't see an elevated um, genetic diversity there. And also, um, a lot of mushrooms actually have the same um, kind of thermal receptor and pheromones um, in both of the genome. And that's why we conclude that thermal receptor and pheromones are not uh, that important in sexual reproduction uh, in amenita phalloides. And so after understanding the general mating system in the normal um, death caps, uh, we can finally study how homokaryotic mushrooms, the the weird ones um, were formed genetically. And uh, so since thermal receptor is not functional, we only need to know how homeo domain genes works. And uh, we know this, inform uh, this information from other uh, model system. And in brief, there are two different genes in uh, homeo domain uh, locus, HD1 and HD2. They both can tra be translated or expressed into um, a protein each. The HD1 uh, and HD2 from the same copy of genome doesn't do much. They don't interact with each other, but um, the HD1 and HD2 from two different genomes, they would interact and form this uh, heterodimer, which means they are bind together and it will uh, transcribe, like express the genes um, that's close to their um, DNA binding site. And so <clears throat> this is a uh, good information. <clears throat> With this, I can establish two, uh, three hypotheses. The first one is duplication of the mating type locus. That means that the HD1 and HD2 from two different uh, from two different copy of genomes somehow got together in a metaphoroides. And so you will have two different uh, compatible uh, HD1 and HD2 in the same genome for it to um, produce mushrooms by themselves. Uh, the second one is self-compatible genes within the well, single mating type uh, locus. And so uh, in one copy of the genome, there's only one um, homeo domain locus, but 
the HD1 and HD2 somehow they can uh, interact with, with each other. And the third one is uh, there are drivers enabling a bypass of the mating type control. And so um, the thing, uh, the, the mushroom form formation is completely um, irrelevant to the mating type. Okay, so the first hypothesis is very easy to test. Uh, we just looked at the assembly of the homokaryotic uh, genomes. And uh, in each homokaryotic mushrooms, there's only uh, one uh, homeo domain uh, locus. And so it means we can just reject the first hypothesis. There's no duplication in the uh, mating type locus. Um, for the second hypothesis, uh, we conducted an experiment called yeast 2 hybrid. And this is basically, um, bringing the HD1 uh, and force binding it with uh, a DNA, DNA binding domain and an HD2 and force it to uh, bind it to a uh, active, um, active domain, which will transcribe or force the gene expression um, of the reported gene. And uh, when HD1 and HD2 not don't interact with each other, uh, the, the reported gene will not be transcribed. But uh, when they are interacting with each other, this uh, protein will bring the DNA binding domain and active domain very close to each other. And so the reported gene will be expressed. Uh, we can use uh, 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 genetic ways to detect uh, this reporter genes expression. Okay, and uh, this is the result. Um, each block is the combination of the HD1 and HD2 in the yeast 2 hybrid assay, assay that I talked about. And the color uh, here um, indicates if the heterodimer or the, oh, yeah, the heterodimer can be formed or the HD1 and HD2 here and here uh, will uh, bind with each other. And you can see these are heterokaryotic mushrooms and the HD1, uh, for example, this one, HD15 and HD213 from two different uh, copy of genomes. Uh, they will interact and produce a signal. And this one produce a very strong signal. And so this sort of uh, confirm our hypothesis, um, confirm what we have observed in other model systems uh, in the death caps. And so now we look at um, the homeo domains genes from the same copy of genome. And you can see the HD1 uh, from the um, genome copy five and HD2 from the genome copy five uh, does not uh, interact with each other. And uh, for HD18 and HD28, they also don't uh, interact with each other. Um, but what we are most interested in is the homo uh, homokaryons. The homokaryons, this mushroom, it has a HD1 thir uh, 13, genome copy 13 from genome copy 13 and HD2 from genome copy 13. And you, as you can see, the, um, the block is very wide, meaning that there's no uh, signal at all. They, uh, the uh, homo domain genes um, in homokaryons do not bind with each other. And so the results suggest the last hypothesis is probably the correct hypothesis. There are drivers enabling a bypass of the making type control. And this is especially similar to the um, unisexual reproduction in the human pathogen, uh, Cryptococcus neoformans. So um, in the invasive range of um, uh, some Cryptococcus species, they also only have one uh, one mating type uh, 
strain. Um, however, they can uh, sexually reproduce in uh, this invasive uh, region. And so uh, people later, later um, name it unisexual reproduction because they only need one single sex to reproduce. And we find it very similar to our system. Okay. So uh, in summary, uh, death caps can develop mushrooms without a mate, similar to invasive plants. Um, homokaryotic death caps can live for a very long time and can also mate with other heterokaryotic death caps. Um, the homokaryotic mushrooms and basidia are similar to the heterokaryotic mushrooms. And uh, homokaryotic mushrooms are likely developed from uh, by factors that bypass mating type control, similar to unisexual uh, reproduction in Cryptococcus neoformans. And uh, so uh, lastly, uh, I would just like to uh, thank some people because this work is not done by myself, but collaboration among wonderful people. The first uh, person I want to talk about is Anne Pringle. Uh, Dr. Anne Pringle is my advisor and she gives me opportunity working on this um, interesting project. And uh, Jacob is my good friend from Anne's lab and as well as uh, lots of other people working together in, on this uh, manuscript. And Christina Hall uh, and uh, her lab, especially Megan and Hunter, they work on the East 2 hybrid, which is uh, that wouldn't happen without them. And Sarah Swanson is a um, technician um, in U UW Medicine who helped me a lot with the uh, microscope. And uh, there are also um, funding, uh, a lot of funders, including University of Wisconsin Medicine, um, Human Frontier Science Program and Mycological Society of America. And uh, so this concludes my talk and I want to thank you for listening and I'll take any question. Oh, thank you so much, Denny. That's incredible work um, and just, you know, an incredible level of complexity. It, it's really amazing to see. Um, the I guess my first question is, you know, big picture, um, you know, are what might be the benefits to to these different types of reproduction and and how does, um, yeah, that's what I guess, you know, what might be the benefit to the species? Yeah, I think that's a very, very great question. And so um, I think there are uh, two questions two sub question in that question. Um, one is uh, why asexual or one why uh, reproducing by yourself? The other is why reproducing with other uh, others? And so um, the reason for why reproducing by yourself is probably it's easy. And so uh, you don't need to find another uh, another uh, mating partner to mate with you. Um, but on the other hand, um, because when you have these DNAs, and uh, DNAs are constantly mutating, and the mutations often will in introduce like uh, deleterious effect, which means that it will harm your organism in the long run. And uh, it would be hard for an organism to get rid of it in evolution. Um, however, when there's these uh, re sexual reproduction, when you are mating with another organism, um, the DNA will exchange. And so the bad, the bad mutation uh, can be uh, switched out um, from, uh, by the good ones. And so I think uh, for Amanita um, they it is very uh, advantageous for them to do sexual um, reproduction um, just in Europe, for example. 
Um, but when they are uh, invading or introduced to a novel region, it's probably beneficial for them to just uh, can be asexual or uh, mating by themselves, unisexual. Because there wouldn't be anyone to mate with, basically. If you're going to a new place, um, yeah. you're the first person there, you don't really have a choice of partners. Is that is that correct? Or? Yeah, that's a hypothesis. Um, um, it's not always the case because uh, right now a lot of like invasion sp invasive species when they are introduced, it's like a huge water dump or a huge soil dump. And so that there will be a lot of um, different individuals in that dump. Um, so we call them uh, invasion paradox that um, when you look at an uh, invasive range, we usually will assume they don't have a lot of diversity, but we often see a lot. And that's probably because of those processes. So it's like there are a lot of different uh, possibilities there. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, that's very interesting. And were you surprised? I know you said in the beginning that you originally got dried material, and that was the material that you, you know, found the Homo carrion type. Um, and you're like, I need to go see this in person and see, you know, is this a strange, is this mushroom as weird as it's as the sex that it's having? Um, so I guess the question that I have is, were you surprised? Were, were you surprised to find that the mushrooms were essentially not um, you couldn't tell them apart visually. I, I guess I don't exactly know what I was expecting. Um, and I think I I think the 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 thing that concerns me the most is that if I will find them again, um, and so there's a possibility that I didn't see any weird mushrooms is just because I didn't find them. And so uh, I think I was more concerned than surprised at the, at the time. And then later uh, when I do the sequencing, I, I found out, okay, um, some of them are actually is, and then I go back to the mushrooms. And so it's not that much of a surprise for me, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. Somebody, um, Rami asked in the chat, can you explain how the fluorescent images were produced? Um, you know, what the setup was and and yeah, how you did it. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the fluorescence image, uh, they are produced by uh with two different stains. Uh one is called vibrant orange, which is uh, uh these red dots. The blue one is calcafluor white, uh, which um which Oh, wait, did I? Okay, so the vibrant orange, it uh, stains the nuclei and the uh, calcafluor white, it stains the, um, the, the cell walls. And uh, generally speaking, uh, for fluorescent imaging, we can just use the fluorescent uh, microscope, um, but the, the resolution is not that high and there are these like weird crystals that will filter out certain uh, wavelength. Doesn't work that well with our um, uh, our our dyes. And so what I did was I used a different uh, microscope. Uh, I kind of forgot that. <laughs> Maybe let me do a quick search. Hmm. Okay, I kind of cannot find the information. Oh, Confoco, yeah, Confoco microscope. Thank you. It's been a while since I used that. Um. Yeah. So I use a Confoco microscope, and it uh can basically there are uh, laser beams that can do uh photo sectioning. That uh basically you have a thicker material and it can scan through different uh, uh, Z position or the, um, the, the depth of that material. And so you can generate 
these images. And uh, also, actually, what we can also do is that we can reconstruct uh, like a 3D um, image so it can spin. Um, but it doesn't work that well with our material. I think it's like just too thick or something. Yeah. Let's see, I think Rami had a response. Oh, good, yeah. I, I pronounced their name correctly. That's great. Okay, I was so glad. Um, okay, so that is a, thank you for explaining that because these images are really, really neat. Um, we do, yeah, I don't know, Mitch, we have, I mean, we have a cool microscope and for our club, but I don't know, would we be able to do that type of imaging or is that like an, another no, level? Totally different. They totally different. Okay. And way more expensive. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> Maybe time for you to grab a, an old one from work. <laughs> we can start doing that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that's, that's really that's really neat though. So we do, uh, Denny, I was going to say, you know, you mentioned New York and I think, I think New Jersey, but we do in Maryland have death caps. I put a link to my own personal observation in the chat. Um, you know, there is a spot, uh, I found them on a golf course in, uh, near Annapolis, Maryland. So definitely, um, interesting here that we have them mostly with, uh, with pine trees, um, Whereas I understand that that's not the case on the West Coast. Yeah, can you say are, any thought? Can you say anything about that, like in terms of the hosts and? Yeah, what I heard is in uh, the Northeast uh, East Coast, it's mostly pine. They are mostly pines, and uh, they like what I heard is mostly from Anne, and she said it's mostly. Uh, restricted in the plot of pine forest in New Jersey. I want to say that. And uh, in West Coast is um, natural oaks, natural oak forest. And so they just spread rapidly. And so, uh, and so yeah, I, I also heard that uh, there's some spread uh, on the East Coast, but I didn't follow that that well. Well, I guess I'm curious, you know, for I so and, and I think like a uh, Mitch, didn't we? I can't remember. I know we had a poison control. Can you say what happened with that? We've had a couple uh, instances of phylloides popping up here. I think it was a couple of years ago. Somebody ate some, and um, they ended up being okay. But yes, we we they they are starting to spread on this coast for sure, and you can see them around here. So I guess one question I have is, you know, given how it's, I think the sightings, at least in our area of this coast are far more sporadic than I understand in California, where it's like really ubiquitous and people just find them quite a bit. Would you make, you know, can I make any assumptions about whether the ones that I photographed are more likely to be homokaryotic or, or dikaryotic, or is there not a way to do that? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so we did collect some mushrooms from uh, New Jersey and tested if they are homokaryotic or not. And uh, the answer is I didn't find any homokaryotic mushrooms. And it doesn't mean that they don't exist in the East Coast because like the West Coast is also pretty rare. And so there's a possibility that um, there's originally there are some homokaryotic mushrooms in the on the east coast, um, but because later on uh, there are uh, other uh, death caps coming and made with the original homokaryotic mushrooms, and the homokaryotic uh, individuals got outcompeted by the new um, stronger heterokaryotic uh, individuals, and that's why we didn't find that. And so one of the hypotheses that I have is that uh, when we go to like invasive front of these uh, mushrooms, uh, these death, death caps, meaning that um, when you have an invas invasive population, the edge of the population, uh, they probably have less, uh, fewer mating partners. And so we probably will see a little bit more um, homokaryotic uh, mushrooms there. 
And so I am guessing, for example, the Maryland one, if is it only one observation or is it a few already? Uh, two, well, I mean, I, I have two observations at the same location from different years, but yeah. I think that there are definitely other other locations as well in Maryland. Um, okay. Right, Mitch? Sure. I think the ones we see against were actually Virginia as well. Okay, yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure the exact location though. And I think there's one, I think Spike has one, um, Spike uh, has one on Mushroom Observer from Virginia when he visited there. So I think Maryland and Virginia definitely have had some legit sightings. Yeah, okay. we actually sequenced the one that, that caused the poisoning yeah. and it came up like clearly Beloides. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So I think if it's like very scarce still in those regions, there's probably we can find some homokaryotic. Um, yeah. And I think it's worth to do some investigation future. So is that the kind of thing that it, so we have, you know, a, a group within our club that's doing DNA analysis and um, they're not really focusing on Amanitas right now, but if they find Amanita phylloides in the future, is that something, is this project still ongoing? Would the Pringle lab want some of that I, issue or is so, it curiosity? So I am curious about it. Uh, my lab right now uh, works on other fungi and it's not working on this. So it might be, it is a little bit hard to persuade them to try to do this. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Anne's still interested, um, but her main focus right now is on toxin and other species. Um, yeah, but I, I think, yeah, she would also appreciate uh, that some uh, people send them um, uh, mushrooms to uh, do some investigations. I do have the ones I collected and dried, so, you know, I can talk about what to do with them. Um, in with her. Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is like a, a big, weird question, but humans don't seem to reproduce uh asexually or unisexually and i'm just curious like I, why not and you know like i saw a stingray there's a article about a stingray that's pregnant at an aquarium and it's a female stingray and is the only stingray in her tank and they're like basically either a shark impregnated her or she had parthenogenesis and oh. impregnated herself and I'm just curious, like if some animals can do parthenogenesis, like why why do why do you think fungi are 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 more able to do this than animals? And like, would we have advantages if we could? And what might the advantages be? This is like a obviously very abstract and theoretical <laughs> question, but yeah, yeah. So so it is interesting. Like um, I think the whole mammal family class uh the whole oh class i think the whole mammalia uh, class uh, has lost their ability to uh, parthenogenesis um you can actually see some like birds they can um uh, reproduce by themselves there's a whole species of lizard um uh, just this uh, they just um uh, uh produce off offspring by uh, females, uh, there's no males at all, and so uh, I don't know like what caused um, uh, humans to not or the mammals not being able to um, uh, unisexually reproduce. I'm maybe it's related to like yeah, I don't know actually. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, um, so it could be just a like an evolutionary death that end for uh, uh, mammals. Um, some random mutation take take it out, and mammals are fine without it. Yeah. Um, and so about if there's any advent, if there would be any advantage, I guess so. When 
we are going to space travel, only one person survive. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Uh, but yeah. specific region a uh, uh, reason for um reproduce um unisexually but space that's a great point i mean that is a great point it's like you know it would be super helpful clones yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so much easier to make them yourself than make them in a lab well, I want to ask if anyone else has any other questions. Um, this was a really neat talk and, and thank you for sharing your work with us. Does anyone else have questions that they want to ask? Feel free to hop on the camera if you do. All right, well, hearing none then, thank you again, Denny. This was terrific. And um, it, I think for me, it's given me a lot of food for thought. Thank you. It's really fun to present here. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. And thanks to everyone tonight. This was a very full meeting and we got through it in, in uh, just under our two hours. So um, we're, we made recordings of everything. They'll be up on YouTube shortly and keep an eye out for Bridget's um, email. So we're trying to get better about sending out a newsletter every month that'll have links to um, that month's presentation and all the announcements that were in my segment. So be sure to open that email. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night.